In today's episode, we're gonna talk about being an employee versus being an entrepreneur, or can you be both? All right, guys, I got another repeat guest this week. This is kind of a rarity. I, uh, most of the time, we, it's, it's kind of an anomaly if we have a repeat guest, but just recently we had some people that pop up that were tremendous guests, and then this specific guest, Mr. Oliver Durer, uh, actually was on the show like three years ago. And I think, I think Oliver, I think you, you pinged me on Twitter with something you were, you were doing or whatever. And it's just the timing aligned perfectly. And you were in the States. And so kind of aligned yeah, at the time, sure. stuff like that. So anyways, here we are. Fortunately, you've made a transition in your life. You're, you're doing things now that maybe were kind of the pieces were falling into place previously when we spoke, but I don't know if it's as fleshed mm -hmm. out as what it is now. So there's a lot that we can talk about and you've got some unique circumstances. So for those that are dealing with transitioning from, hey, I have this job to now I'm running this business or you know whatever that looks like for you, whatever that tra life transition looks like for you. But also, I hear a lot of people talk about managing their relationships when it comes to, okay, I now had this job where there was stability, there was consistency, there were you know hours that we could predict nine to five, right? You check in, you check out. This guy that I'm gonna introduce you today as a repeat, was dating and now engaged to someone that lives in California while he lives in Switzerland, correct? Correct. Unbelievable long distance <laughs> relationship. So we're gonna talk about a lot about that on the personal side, also the business transition, what he's doing now, uh, and then kind of really unpack some valuable nuggets for you guys. But without further ado, Oliver, man, welcome back, brother. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm good. I'm in California right now, so. Yeah. Sunshine, warm weather, beautiful. Can't beat that. I came home last night thinking I'm coming back to the warm, the warm, you know, Austin temperature, or whatever, from Baltimore. We get off the plane, it's sleeting and it's 29 degrees. Like, what is happening? Where am I? Did they drop us off in Canada? What is going on here? Pretty 70 wild, plus dude. here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty wild here, dude. Awesome, man. So, what's been up? I know you told me about it beforehand. We were kind of chat, chit chatting a little bit about mm -hmm. for those that didn't catch, I think it was episode 95, it was just prior to mm -hmm. episode 100. Um, so kind of give us some context about what you were doing and then what you're doing now, and then walk us through that transition. Because I think a lot of people, mm -hmm. Oliver, I think for entrepreneurs, it's really difficult. They kind of know where they want to be. They have a difficult mm -hmm. time tracing out or mapping out those steps, right? It's like, what's mm -hmm. the next viable step? So the transition or the move feels like this big grandiose thing when it's really not, it's just about taking and mm -hmm. navigating those practical steps. But I think entrepreneurs, we think, so big and we have these big visions and mm. you know these ideas of things that we want to do that i think it's harder mm. for us to see what may be obvious for other people so walk us through what that transition was for you and then we'll talk about some of the micro elements of what you did to arrive there okay yeah last time we we spoke was uh almost three years ago two and a half yeah. years and i was um i was a corporate entrepreneur i've been doing that for a while before i've always been navigating between um uh, an entrepreneurial background in a family business mm -hmm. and working with corporate startups or corporate structures where I had a lot of entrepreneurial freedom, which I was also craving and I was pushing for. And that was something that really drove me. And I was always the, the weird guy, I would say, within the big company who was working as if it was my own business, right? Whether it was a big or smaller structure, it didn't matter. It was just the, the drive I had and the passion and this purpose orientation made me work as if it was my own company. Mm. And um, that also, however, brought me to push, I would say, the envelope and find limits um, to degrees where I was continuously exploring things. And I was doing the corporate entrepreneurship thing uh, with Nestle for, for 10 years. Um, then uh, transitioned, did some freelancing, helping big corporations, the entrepreneurial, uh, the entrepreneurship, uh, mentoring, coaching thing, using lean innovation stuff, because I was also passionate about working with startups. And I would say I was always in between these two things. And when we last spoke, I was a corporate entrepreneur and we were actually having just proven uh, successful, the proof of concept that we were uh, doing for this EdTech startup. Mm -hmm. And we were about to see how we could further scale that and hit the next level. And strategically, the decision was we need to integrate it so that we could leverage better the synergies with the different uh, services, the shared services from this big uh, company, Migrocop School. It's basically uh, Switzerland's biggest further education institution. And uh, they're a very specific type of company. They're a cooperative. 
structure. So we decided to integrate the online academy, this edtech business that we built as a corporate startup in some sort of sandbox into the corporate structure to hit the next level of scale. And at the same time, we decided to further boost the transition and the, the cultural change element that mm. this uh, little virus was supposed to bring in and to make it go viral within the larger corporate structure, uh, we built an innovation lab. And I was already working 80% part-time mm. uh, at the time, reduced then to 60%, seems counterintuitive having two mandates and reducing mm. from 80 to 60. Um, but it was clearly defined and we were very focused on, okay, um, two thirds of that 60% is going to be the integration basically, or, or one third, and two thirds is going to be building an innovation lab. So mm. this next level structure to accommodate more of these speedboats of these little corporate, um, let's say startups, or even uh, innovate, not in a disruptive way, but incrementally on processes on uh, having the best impact of the existing portfolio and make it as relevant as possible uh, for ever-changing consumer needs. And that was also the time where for me, it was clear that I wanted to increase even further my own impact and not be restricted, sounds weird, but not um, expand my focus basically from one company to be able to take all that I had learned from you know, startups, from medium businesses, from, from this large scale structures and take that out and, and go out on my own. And that was the starting point for Swiss Leap, mm. where uh, Leap stands for Lasting Enterprise Action Practices. And it was literally the, the, the mission that uh, we gave ourselves um, is that we wanted to empower these, we call them purpose-driven pioneers, mm -hmm. right? Whether they're startuppers just launching out, whether they're within a, you know, a family business, a medium-sized business, want to increase their impact, want to have more growth on a personal but also professional level, or uh, the big structures that need to kind of re reinvent themselves. So Swiss Sleep was literally, how can we help these purpose-driven pioneers create shared value and increase their impact? by using basically the combination of the different tools of lean innovation, lean startup, uh, design thinking, agile methods, and the more big corporate things in terms of performance, uh, financial, operational performance, strategy, structure, uh, you name it. How can we bring that together and custom tailor it to the specific situation of this individual, the, the team, the, the larger, let's say, ecosystem? really working with these organizations as organisms and helping them um, to reach the next level. So that, that was basically the, the key thing. And as you mentioned, that was the professional side. On the personal side, yeah. met my now fiance in, in Spain, even though she's, uh, she's living, she lives in San Diego. Congratulations and again. Thank you so much. And, and been doing uh, basically the, the business building on the private on the per, professional side and the the relationship with uh, my fiance on the personal side and so yeah that was kind of a not easy thing to combine both <laughs> Oof, man i can't imagine i want to get to that i'm gonna get to that in a minute but but i want to go back i'm gonna try to unpack everything you said kind of in some kind of chronological order here the mm -hmm. first thing i think you mentioned that's really interesting is you talked about in any job you've ever had you just kind of like took ownership of it and, and you kind of treat mm -hmm. it like your own business Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've mentioned this, this has come up several times. I'm sure my audience, if they've been following religiously, they're kind of tired of hearing me talk about this. But I always tell people, quit. There's too many entrepreneurs in my, in my view that they think if they're not working on their business full time, that they're not investing and moving forward. They're like, mm -hmm. they feel stuck. And I think that's mm -hmm. such a misnomer. I think that anything yeah. you do in life is building to a crescendo towards something that you ultimately want to do if you view it that way and if you use everything as an opportunity, right? So. I have used this phrase of saying that your job, if you treat it appropriately and if it's in the right field, is like an intern. It's like a paid internship, right? Yeah. Because fundamentally speaking, you're acquiring a lot of the contacts, the resources, the skills, the know-how, that all will readily apply to what you're doing. And I've seen several examples, not unlike yourself, where that's mm -hmm. been the case. So here's my question for you on that, because this is an avenue we haven't touched on, mm -hmm. is I know a lot of people that, myself included, right? where I, people don't know this, but I spent my first six months out of college while I was building my business, uh, my first business, I, I had a job, 
And I really try to push the envelope. I think you even mentioned that verbatim is what mm -hmm. you said, push the envelope, mm -hmm. move things mm -hmm. forward, kind of take ownership of what at this point was the digital aspect, the digital division of our company. Cause I knew that's yeah. where the market was going. Crazy pushback to that. Like I was viewed as like, you know, why isn't this guy just falling in line? Why is he not complying? Why is he being this and that? They, they call me like the, you know, the Cal Mr. California cool coming in, trying to just push all this digital <laughs> stuff. Like, but it was just me being an entrepreneur. So here's, here's my question to you. Were you just in a, a, a environment that was conducive to allowing you to do that? Right? Like did your job, did they just have a good culture to welcome people that took ownership, which I would say is a great thing for an organization to have, or did you navigate it in a way that was far better than what I did in that it allowed you to do that, but you knew where your limitations were, where you couldn't push any further, or you could push here, but not push there. Which do you think it was? Kind of walk us through how you navigated that and how, why it worked out the way that it did effectively. First of all, I agree with you. It's really not about doing it, you know, um, full time. It's, it's a build up. It, it works as a build up. And um, then the second thing is, I think it's a mix of both. So me really navigating and, and gravitating towards the most entrepreneurial like experiences that I could get. And at the same time, being lucky uh, that I was working for 10 years for Nestle with Nestle and Nestle is known to have a pretty strongly decentralized culture where actually power is really pushed down to, uh, you know, the, the delegation is pretty strong and you can have a full P&L profit and loss responsibility, your own business basically within the business where in other companies, you only get that at the level of country manager, right? Mm -hmm. of, of basically just general sure. director. So that was uh, a mix. It was, I would say, a good ground, like a good context that I found. But within that context, I was pushing the envelope, as you said, uh, as, as much as I could. And the other thing is also, uh, for me, it's always been about learning. It's, it's literally the common denominator uh, for any endeavor, and especially in entrepreneurship, be it within a big corporation, be it with, within whichever context, it's all about really understanding and then learning, out learning, accelerating your learning in a human-centered way. So really understand deeply what the problem is your customers, your target, your whatever you may call it, have before you go about building the solution. I think that's a key thing to what you mentioned. It's really, um, it's about working smart as much as it is about working hard. And and I also keep hearing uh, some of our clients or, or even in, in, in environments like the private side and friendships, uh, friend, having conversations with friends where they're like, yeah, uh, either, I don't know, I don't have uh, enough capital, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough this or that, or I don't have the right idea yet, and so on and so forth. So there's always, uh, as you said, it seems so big, right? Or specifically also to that, you want to create something big. You have a big vision. You want to have a lot of impact as much as you could possibly create. And then it creates kind of a paralysis because it seems so huge to overcome. Yeah. And instead of just starting and taking that first step and breaking it down into junk, and actually, again, focusing on the learning rather, so the process rather than the outcome, um, I would say is always the trick to get going, to start and to then gain momentum. Sure, sure. Okay. So, but yeah, a mix of both. What really. would you say if somebody wasn't in a situation, right? Like I wasn't, I wasn't in a Nestle situation. That, that was mm -hmm. not the case. It was your typical hierarchy of this is your boss. This is the mm -hmm. person you directly report to. This is where you are and you fall mm -hmm. in line. And if you mm -hmm. do anything outside of that, it's kind mm -hmm. of viewed as you going over your boss's head or going around them or whatever, where mm -hmm. it's not deemed. So um, I, I, I don't know what to, advice to give people. And I think it's case by case. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can give mm -hmm. just general blanket advice. Mm -hmm. Would you suggest, because part of that process of, you know, you talked about somebody having something big and then taking, getting started, having their steps, letting things mm -hmm. together. But I think what ends up happening, this is what happened with me. If I was in a situation like you with Nestle, I would have right. been able to kind of let my skills evolve, learn things from an organization, kind of learn what it meant to be in business and all those things did help me. Mm -hmm. But the fact that my environment wasn't conducive to entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. right? Wasn't conducive to me taking ownership of things. Mm -hmm. I ended up quitting 
because that's not who I am at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And so mm -hmm. my entrepreneur inside was, was going to come out regardless. So I jumped mm -hmm. into my business head first and it was painful AF the first six months. I mean, I was, I've told people my story. I was flat broke. I was doing laundry in my bathtub. Mm -hmm. I was losing a ton of weight cause I couldn't afford food. Like it was pretty painful. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's tough to say, okay, stay in something that you hate where they don't embrace you being an entrepreneur. They don't embrace your entrepreneurial tendencies or quit and get your ass handed to you. Right? So, what's the advice that you would give them or what would you have done rather let's mm. say you were in a situation like mine where nestle wasn't as you know pushing things down really embracing mm. delegation you know taking advantage of people like yourself that are smart and have good ideas and you know mm. are willing to push the envelope and stuff like that what would be the advice you give them so that people don't feel stuck in their jobs and feel like they can explore and exercise those muscles mm. while they make the transition you were talking about into this big idea that they have um the answer is uh the that's that's the cool part about it is i would say you can actually go about it the same way whether you try and push as far as you can the envelope within your current situation as an employee in whichever you know big or medium or whatever size company whereas uh, you would go about it if you were to launch your own business and what I mean by that, and that's why I'm such such an aficionado about lean startup and yeah. an agile method. It's yeah. literally starting with understanding what is what is breaking down your big vision in into what basically the I like to call one of the golden triangles: your problem, customer, solution, or customer problem solution. So really, like, okay, for whom, for which customer are you trying to solve which problem, and make sure you actually understand who has that problem and what that problem really looks like before you go about building a solution. So that applies to uh, doing that and approaching it in this structured fashion, whether you're within or like a big company or you're an employee, or you're actually testing a potential side hustle that you could then transition into. That's basically also what I have been doing in a way. This is in their job. This is in their employee. This yes. is not in their side business. This is actually yes. in their job to still okay. pursue it that way. Let, let's take a specific example. Like, yeah. let's say you you have a hunch, and and uh, well, I can actually take my my dad's example. That's Perfect. that's what he did. So he had this vision. He was like, okay, I believe that there can be a solution to this specific problem that I have identified, involving the products that the company was well, was working and an employee back at the time could help solve. And it was about high precision um, laser based measurement techniques. Okay. Right. So laser sensors. And he was convinced that he could find a solution in a in an integrative way, basically to use that to solve a very specific problem. Um, built a case, uh, suggested that to his employer, suggested it to his boss, suggested, tried a number of times, got frustrated, and basically then quit. But still, it in the very same process that he had actually started out was actually continuing then as first a solopreneur like uh, in, in your own not even building a, a, a company like a what is it called an LLC or whatever just a sole proprietorship there you go and basically went to that customer said I know we have you have that problem I may have a solution how about we try and build it together right so he would have done the same thing if he was the sales guy and the product guy in his role before as an employee what he then wasn't allowed to do so he just set out to do that the exact same way basically then as an independent entrepreneur okay as a sole proprietor right and it just so turned out that he was right and i mean fast forward what 15 20 years later uh -huh. the same company that didn't let him pursue that vision then bought back his company by then and there's still actually the i think fastest growing most profitable business unit worldwide of this company wow right. this was your dad you so, said the, yeah that was my dad that's great <laughs> okay so all right so just so, everybody me. <laughs> so move in the direction of this is the vision that i have whether my company agrees with it or not i'm going to keep moving down that path and if they mm -hmm. don't go if they go for it great then we introduce this thing and i'm the hero that introduced this new methodology if they don't go for it fine you splinter off you've already been working that direction anyways you're just going to get mm -hmm. to a fork in the road where you either go your way or you keep going yep. your way yes and the thing being the way you go about this and i was mentioning lean startup being so crucial and the customer problem solution sure. thing sure. you want to have your problem solution fit. so really deeply understand your problem and before you build your solution and be sure to test that with the customer 
So really the key thing is get access to your customer from within your company as an employee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really like that's, that's so key. Yeah, and, and that's learn. something you won't have as an individual that learn. the company does have. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So learn, focus on learning. It's as when you, when you try to raise funds, when you, when you want money, you get advice. When you want advice, you may actually end up getting money. Yeah. And it's the same thing with, with um, focusing on learning to better understand your customer and your problem. And the great thing in, in my experience is the more you do that, do it in a holistic and inclusive way, meaning involve your hierarchy involve your internal corporate stakeholders so then you don't have to sell them anything later on you take on board all their uh, doubts and challenges and why it will not work and you say great this is an assumption let me test this with the customer i'll be back in two weeks and we'll actually not discuss opinions we'll discuss evidence because we've built experiments we gather data basically through these experiments and that gives us evidence to then be able to uh, confirm or infirm and learn whether or not this is actually something that you could build further. And that's what I mean by the magic of this learning process. It actually yeah. works in a, in a customer centric way, sure. but it works also in a stakeholder centric fashion within your organization to better um, convince or not even convince to better get buy in from your hierarchy. Yeah. So that's again, it's the same kind of way you can do this, whether you're an intrapreneur or an entrepreneur. Now, did your okay. did your dad in that situation? Um, did he where they didn't initially go for it? Mm -hmm. Did he tell them, "I don't give a shit, I'm doing it anyways"? Or like, how do you keep doing it where they're not like, <laughs> "Hey, this guy's being a little schmuck and he's still doing it anyways," even though we we vetoed that and we said you, you move on from that project. Mm. That's the part that I'm see. Like, I get yeah. the, the idea and I think it's great. I think that's amazing. But but I, yeah. I also understand that corporate politics are what they are. And sometimes if yeah. you start challenging that hierarchy too much. Uh -huh even if you keep pushing forward with something there. Yeah. So in that situation, would you recommend, Hey, you probably should find another job that's more conducive to allowing for entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you would recommend a lateral yes. movement. I, I would say, because there is only so much you can do. And at a certain okay. point, again, it's not smart anymore to just okay. work hard like crazy, but not yeah. actually even be allowed to have a shot at potentially gaining traction. So yes, there is a point where there's yeah. going to be that fork in the road. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Cause I didn't know if he, this is tough. Cause I didn't know if he, they said no. And then he just mm -hmm. did it until he had it to a point where he proved it and then came mm -hmm. back to them or, mm -hmm. and then how that was received knowing that we told you to kill this thing, but you kept doing it anyways, because <laughs> no, then it's an ego, case. because then it's an ego <laughs> thing too. Right. Then it's case. like, Hey, yeah. you did this anyway, despite the fact that we told you mm -hmm. not to. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was kind of trying to get my, wrap my mind around, okay, like how would this look in the real world mm -hmm. of, you do this thing anyways, despite mm -hmm. the fact we told you not to, how mm -hmm. is that going to be received? And I think in most si people's situations, they would probably say, my boss would kill me if I did that anyways, despite the fact that, yeah. you know what I mean? So that's, that's mm -hmm. tough. I think the mm -hmm. world, like you said, is changing. I think a lot of organizations now are embracing people's ideas mm -hmm. and they're open that and they even, mm -hmm. they even encourage people to, to bring new yeah. ideas to the table. And I think that's a beautiful thing because we all have so much more to offer than yeah. um, just being robots basically and doing these monotonous tasks and just exactly. doing data inputs and stuff like that like we're creative at mm -hmm. our core right it's what the human exactly. brain is designed to do and that's exactly what's going to be always in my I'm, I'm convinced about that that's what's going to be always separating and differentiating us from machines so yes. speak, robots artificial intelligence yeah. whatever you may call it is creativity critical yeah. thinking and collaboration solving, yeah collaborative creative problem solving really yeah. these things are so innately human and you don't want to be uh, competing with machines they'll always out compete you yeah. right in these fields however it's it's really these gray zones i would say these, these difficult to navigate fields where it's not binary it's not digital it's not yeah. it's not zero or one right and i think that's um in a way where my dad in his way in fashion chose at a point to to quit and to do this on his own where I was probably I had less courage maybe to do that and so I tried to push and push and push more yeah, and I would yeah, yeah. argue so quite successfully and I don't I have no regrets I, I really had a great time and I learned a ton and it was amazing I may have been doing this way earlier even friends kept telling me like what are you still doing being an employee you're like you should be an entrepreneur and I was like yeah. well because what I can contribute to 
as an employee is the same thing I want to contribute to right, if right. I were to go out as an entrepreneur. So right. that's that's where I find my my fuel. Right? That's where the, the paid internship comment comes into play. Right? Yeah. Like you were you, you had all the things that an entrepreneur has and you were building those skills mm-hmm. to where now I know your launching point is going to be tremendous, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I will say this. I think the reason I'm sticking on this a little bit is because it's just how poorly I navigated it. Um, <laughs> but the last comment I want to make on and then we're going to move on is one thing I could have done better, and I want to see if you agree with this, mm-hmm. is be transparent. Because wow. with my boss, the reason it didn't, it went so poorly is because mm-hmm. he, he, I knew he wasn't in favor of it. And I didn't say, hey, I deeply care about this. I think this is where mm-hmm. the market's going. I understand my demographic. We're, we are now becoming consumers in the market, right? We're graduating, moving on. I know this is what we prefer is the digital mm-hmm. space. And kind of made my, give me the chance to go prove it to you. Let me go talk mm-hmm. to customers and let me prove it to you and actually present a report. What I did mm-hmm. was I just kind of slingshot it at him. Mm-hmm. And then I went off and tried to do it anyways, even though he yeah. said no, right? So I think mm-hmm. I could have done a better job of making my argument more compelling and asking permission to give me a chance to prove it versus just being a renegade and going out and doing it on my own, mm-hmm. despite the fact that he said no. So I think transparency mm-hmm. and open lines communication maybe would have served me a little bit better. I don't want people to run out there and just start doing crazy stuff because, yeah. you know, we said, hey, just go do it. And if they go for yeah. it, go yeah. for it. If they're not, and screw them, just go yeah. do it on your own. You know what I mean? I want to make sure mm-hmm. that we give them really good practical advice. Absolutely. That I, A, I agree with you. And B, that's, that's very similar to what I meant, be inclusive. So be okay. transparent, okay. but also be inclusive because in that specific case, imagine you would have... Being transparent with your boss, what your vision is, what you may have already as assumptions, maybe yeah. even already gathered evidence yeah. through experiments or in whichever fashion through desk research, through your own experience of what you have uh, been able to gather as evidence for what you're assuming. Yeah. But then also take on board his challenges, his yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. why he, he doesn't want you to do what you would like to do and what you right. think. Uh, could work and that there is a market for that and it's going into this direction etc and then co-create together again collaboration creative yeah. collaborative problem solving create together experiments really do this mindset switch with your boss seeing the assumptions behind what you feel mm. could work or will happen and what he feels wow. or is afraid of what may happen or may not happen and try and test that and that again is the magic of lean start of building a, a minimum viable product of yeah. building experiments really at low cost with the maximum learning involved yes. but the least effort possible to gather evidence for these assumptions and and yeah. in my like case it was my former boss after two minutes when we did this uh, first lean innovation workshop within Migro, she had this literally epiphany where she was like wow I just realized that all these things that I had, like that I thought, I realized all these are, are assumptions. And not only, I realized we can test them and we can mm-hmm. have answers and invalidate or validate them super quickly and super easily and doesn't cost much. And that's going to make us so much faster. Yeah. And she was like instantly right. flipped around and, and, and like, wow, okay, this is, this is what you've been talking about. This is how you're doing this with the online academy. That's such, I, a, I mean, <laughs> that's such a, a really, really good point because immediately when I think about that, I think about context because mm-hmm. as you as an employee, you don't have the context of all of the multifaceted issues mm-hmm. that the leader of an organization has. And, and, and I'll, mm-hmm. I'll validate that. In my in that situation, that particular situation, I'll, I'll just, this is the only one I have at this point. So it's the only real mm-hmm. job I've ever had outside of being an entrepreneur. <laughs> so it's the only one I can refer back to. Right. Um, the re- one of the primary reasons that my boss was not in favor of me pursuing digital as hard as I wanted to at that specific mm. point is because he had bulk ordered more of a conventional mm-hmm. system and the mm-hmm. major nationwide player that we had worked with, which is a recognizable global company, by the way, uh, right. decided to back out and go a different direction. So we had sunk cost in these specific conventional units that he purchased and he wanted to get rid of those first because we had financially we were invested right. in that more so than we were in what i wanted to do so right. had i had those conversations and we had come to an agreement of look help me sell these and then i'll help you pursue this i would have mm-hmm. had a completely different context other than mean boss won't let me do what i want to do right mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that's the that's the stuff yeah. that we don't have is 
the view from the other side of what's actually going on in the organization that you you're able to glean when you do what you said, which is being inclusive and having those conversations. Absolutely. And, and the key thing, and I've been talking a lot about, you know, gathering evidence through experiments, but the first element, the first E, and I've learned this from, from my friend, Brian Cooper, who is also based in San Diego, um, is empathy. So mm. it's really understanding the human, whether it's your boss, whether it's any stakeholder in your organization, or, and especially it's your client, your customer. Present, future, repeat, uh, you know, loyal, doesn't matter. That's really the key thing. And that's, that's the key thing that we humans are really good at. That's yeah. why uh, it's so important to listen and learn and really observe behavior, not just listen to what people say, because, and I may have, again, I'm, I'm on auto repeat on this one, no. what people say versus what they do totally. is, is always three worlds within uh, or in between. And yeah. what, what you want to do is with these experiments is you create something like in the lab, in the laboratory, in the scientific context where you test your hypothesis in an experiment where you can observe actual behavior versus what they say they would do, you can actually observe what they are doing. Uh, and that's so different. That is right? different. Interesting. And that, that is really, really crucial. And that is also then where the discussions get much easier and it takes a lot of the politics out of the discussion. Because yeah. It's not anymore about ego. It's not whether you are right whether you're, <laughs> or your evil or not evil boss is right. It's just... Yeah. What is your interpretation of these results of this data? Yeah. And that's an entirely different story. And then again, you're in a co-creation, co-analysis, co-interpretation mode, rather than confrontational, I believe this is, uh, this is answer A, and no, I think it's rather answer B. Hmm. Right? So maybe, and in my experience, most likely, that's probably because, you know, coming from Switzerland, we're all about consensus. It's often the higher way. There's often a, a third way, a higher way, and it's not A or B. It's usually like yin yang. It's not black or white. It's gray, somewhere in between. Sure. And the great thing is you can dig deeper into this gray area in a positive way by testing these assumptions, mm. starting out with the most critical for your business, where you have the most remaining uncertainty. And that's also something really for anyone wanting to start out or just starting out start with the biggest business impact assumption mm. and be sure that it is an assumption. Make that mindset shift and figure out how you can test that assumption with the least effort in terms of resources. So time, money, um, whatever, and as, as quickly as possible get conducive results. So then you can move on to the next crucial hypothesis that you want to test. And, and that's also how you avoid these huge billion dollar, you know, uh, A, you don't have a billion dollars, <laughs> and mm -hmm. B, um, you you want to learn as fast as possible with as little resources as you have. And the beauty of that is at the same time, it gives you traction, but this traction also gives you a better story, a better pitch deck, and better access to sure. be it angel investments or venture capital yeah. or whatever um, financial support you're looking for, even if it's a bank credit. Yeah. Well, you have an actual story to tell right. with data, with evidence from experiments. That's awesome. And I think that really changes the whole, the whole totally. game. Totally. Okay. One of the things that I can imagine, and, 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 I, and I've been involved with a startup where this was indeed the case, is we talked about going that one fork of the road, right? And fighting mm -hmm. the bosses and stuff like that and kind of navigating that or, or you know, trying to build this with inside entrepreneurship with inside mm -hmm. an organization. Let's say you go the other fork, the other route, the other side of the fork mm -hmm. and you end up kind of branching off and doing your own thing, right? Which is what you've done, okay? Mm -hmm. And I've seen this happen a lot. And, and oftentimes I see like your case is what you built, the company you work for becomes your first customer, right? And that's, <laughs> that's, like, that's the perfect yeah. ideal scenario, right? But I have seen in some cases, and I want to address this because it does happen, where the company or the institution, sometimes in this, in this case, for my situation, it was an educational, it was a university. And so mm -hmm. we had built this thing and I didn't build it. It was pretty sweet, actually. It was, uh, we were using Google Glass, but we had built in this mechanism where electrodes connected to it. So you could actually control simple devices with your mind of the Google Glass. Nice. How badass is that, right? Nice. But here's the deal. When, <laughs> when, when, when our partner, who was our, our managing partner, when she decided she wanted to take that commercially, because that's a very viable product, if we could you mm. know, build upon mm. that, it's pretty wild. But um, 
the university was like, uh, uh-uh, we want 50% because it becomes a battle over intellectual property because you've now developed something yeah. internally. And so they feel use that you use their resources, their customers, their, their staff mm-hmm. potentially to help mm-hmm. develop this thing that they want ownership or at least a huge chunk of ownership. So how do you navigate that? So you're not creating your own legal monster with whatever you're building because that IP thing, when they see there's a lot of money to be made, sometimes mm-hmm. they will start causing a fuss about it. So how do you navigate that? Um, it's interesting because uh, it, it's a very real thing for me right now. It's actually something we are discussing. So A, my my last former employer became our first client as well, yeah. uh, amongst others, because we were lucky to basically have a really good start right off the bat in terms of also having big corporate customers as well as startups, as well as medium uh, and enterprises. And of course, it's different, I would say, as a rule of thumb, there's more fear and more maybe also sensitivity to legal matters on the big guy side versus the the startup, I would say. There's more, okay, a handshake, uh, we'll find the pragmatic solution, we'll we'll see where it leads us to, we'll we'll build and we'll adjust as we go. It's more what happens there as a rule of thumb again not always the case seeing both ki- uh, both um, cases but on the other hand side and we're actually discussing this but uh, with with uh, with my former employer the beauty however is that it is in a very partner like uh, fashion so we were very clear from the beginning we said okay let's do this together actually to win an internal mandate from migros as well um, together with my former team um, in a fashion that there are as many synergies as possible, right? And then we will navigate how we can actually see and potentially scale this further so that it's not just an internal training solution, but it can actually be applied to sure. the market. Right. And of course, knowing that and having, again, the scalability right. uh, in mind uh, allowed us to be already addressing this head on actually right now. I had a call yesterday about this topic and I'm pretty confident that we'll find a solution. Okay. However, since we're still, you know, discussing, I don't want to no, 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 say right, too right, right, much right, about right. it. No, but no, no. What, what I can and what I will say is really it's about um, how can you make this a win-win? Sounds super cheesy, sounds simple and it's not. But so what are, again, to your point, transparency? What are What is in it and what is the main goal basically from each party? Mm-hmm. What are like Swiss Sleep's interests in actually scaling this? How can this be a, a product that for us has some sort of um, independency in terms of being time and place neutral? Since yeah. it's an information product, it's a training product, a learning product versus other elements that we could add to that, that could also be added to other customers from Migros right. and Migro Club School. So that's basically where we're where we're going in terms of okay, how can we build this into a bigger whole and make a big bake a bigger pie basically rather than just focusing on what we are now co creating together is how can we build this further right, right. and then which direction of the further build is more interesting and more relevant to either party and then basically give more of the one or the yeah. other to each party. So that that's kind of like how we tried to structure that. Yeah, it's a tough song and dance, man, because I've seen some people where they try to downplay what they're doing because they don't want to mm-hmm. give away a sizable piece of the company, but mm-hmm. then they want the resources like they're doing something big in the world. Mm-hmm. Like they want mm-hmm. them to get behind it, but they don't want them <laughs> to get too behind it because then they want a bigger chunk mm-hmm. of the pie, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and I don't, so honestly, cut me off if, if because I don't want you to lose any negotiating power, right? That like, this is mm-hmm. not something I want you to reveal your hand, right? <laughs> because it's important that you don't like screw this up over a podcast. Interview. But if you're the little guy, which which in this mm-hmm. case you are, right? You're you have a, a big corporation and mm-hmm. a big company. They've got the reputation. They've got all the various assets that I mentioned, and you've just created mm-hmm. this thing that really could be valuable for both of you. Yeah. If someone else, not you. Someone else. We're mm-hmm. gonna take you out of the equation. <laughs> Hypothetically. Hypothetical scenario. Okay. <laughs> what would you recommend that they do so that they um, have? feel like they have some negotiating yeah. power at the table uh, right. when they to say like, okay, yes, I know that mm-hmm. you have reputation. You're a globally recognized mm-hmm. brand potentially. You have all mm-hmm. the money. You have all the resources. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I couldn't have built this without you. So, but I'm trying really hard and I'm working really hard. So how do you build up your, you see what I'm saying? Cause otherwise you feel like you don't have an argument yeah. at that table. You feel like I'm sitting at yeah. this table and I have no negotiating leverage mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So if you were in a hypothetical scenario in another startup and you weren't Oliver, someone else, <laughs> what would be your leveraging assets that you would really cite in that discussion, mm -hmm. in those negotiating tables? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll be a little higher level on this and less specific, but I, I still think it comes down to three things. I like the, the three, you know, the triangles. The, Let's do it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's literally, first, um, be very clear about what you want. So okay. start with your end goal in mind. Okay. Like to get what you want, you need to know what it is that you actually want. And, and we're talking right? like revenue milestones or are we talking? For instance, is it, is it, what are you looking for? Is it reach? Is it awareness? Are right. you more into like uh, the customer base of your partner? Right. Are you into uh, maximizing you reach them? or going premium? Is it uh, that you are more into synergies, getting resources so that you don't have to, um, Okay. look for these or pay okay. in, a, in a way overpriced uh, whereas uh, your partner may already have shared services yeah. uh, that can help with that yeah. um, and so on and so forth so really be very clear about what, what is important for you and like have your um, priorities straight in that sense also then know what is your what they call in negotiations your batna your best alternative to a negotiated agreement so basically, what is your walking away point mm. and what is going to happen then, right? So really know what do I want, but also onto where am I ready to still accept to strike a deal and when do I walk away from the table and <laughs> what's going to happen then, right? Because yeah. that will inform basically your negotiation um, approach, your yeah. strategy, but also your tactics. So that's the first thing, know what you want. Do second thing is do your research about your partner and don't consider it a competitor or like an opponent, consider yeah. it a partner because okay. that really matters. That mindset matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When yeah. you go into it and you're like, okay, this is a actually, even I don't really see it in a way as a negotiation. Of course, I'm fully aware it is a negotiation, but sure, I sure. see it as how can we create a maximum of shared value to a win win? How can we hit this higher way? How can we get there? So mindset-wise, that totally changes the game. And third, last but not least, really about mindset. You said you're the little guy. Well, it's interesting because one of the elements in a, in a training product that I've been helping to evaluate, it was about negotiation. And I've already had, of course, my share of negotiations in my, <laughs> my past and, sure. and currently also, and it, it's also kind of a life thing. But it was really interesting. Uh, one thing that stuck out to me when evaluating different content was what they call how important the inner game is. And typically to the example of the small guy versus the big guy. The specific example was the small guy was like what you just described. Oh, but we're so small. We don't have the firepower. We don't have a legal department. We don't have the resources. We don't have anything. The big guys, on the other hand, so we're in the weaker position, right? We're, we're off to lose. This at least that's, that's the narrative we tell ourselves. Yes. Because it's a win-lose, right? Right. And, and the big guy is like, oh my God, we have so slow internal processes. We are so bureaucratic. Yes. We are so not fast, like the nimble, small, fast players. They're going to outrun us. They're going to outcompete us. We're yeah. like, we're, you know, so what does it come down to? It's, it's the inner game. It's really how do you position yourself yeah. into this whole thing? Yeah. It's whether you believe you can or not, you're right. Either way, right? It's the same thing. So if I think that's the key thing, it starts with this mindset. How do you go into it? And then you start being clear on what you want and what is the priority, what is your strategy and what is to get to this win-win? What is it that your opponent, again, your partner, not your opponent, what your opponent wants? And then be transparent and co-create it together. Create this win-win, yeah. find this higher way, yeah. right? And then it's not a win-lose. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you say that because there's so many people that and and then in a non this isn't a uh, example where it's in the the same capacity that we're talking about, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of entrepreneurs they have that mindset of I'm the little guy, and I, I've I've seen some people that have held themselves back. It's clients of mine mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. have held themselves back, and and I've told them I'm like, look, 
the next opportunity for you is to start selling online, right? I mean, that's a, that's a very natural progression for a lot of companies is, hey, I'm providing this service and I've rented it and we're making four to $5 million a year locally. How do we start using that? And I've seen people do that. There was an example, uh, one of the, the, I think they got one of the highest amounts for the amount of equity they gave up on in Shark Tank history was in my mm-hmm. college town when I was building the business that I was building. And majority, I think like 80 to 90% of what they do now, is not at their little boutique, it's online, right? But here's the deal. Some of these people have told themselves, I can't compete with Amazon or I can't compete with whoever that's already selling stuff online. It's like, dude, I don't think you realize for one, you're gonna hit a certain niche that they're not gonna hit, right? That's the first thing. But second of all, like you said, it's such a valid point is just because they're big, doesn't mean they're nimble. Doesn't mean exactly. that they're gonna have the ability to, to move around and pivot and, and be as mm-hmm. agile as you can be, which gives yep. you a huge strategic advantage, right? Yeah. So I think that's they a really valid point. They may have the stamina, the stability, but you have the speed, you yes. have the agility, yes. exactly. Yes. And that, that's always what we call the yin yang of the big yes. and the small ones. Bring them together. That's what we're doing. What, what we're doing with Swiss Leap is you know really what I, combining you know, these two. And you know what else is the other thing is too is they say that I'm like you know what that means if you can create this thing that they haven't been able to create, mm-hmm. it's going to be more cost effective for them to acquire you than to allocate yes. the resources to compete with yes. you. Absolutely. Agree. So you're yeah. building you're, you're building yeah. something that someone wants to buy from you effectively. Like yeah. hey, I see you're doing this. Will you like let's build this? I'm gonna kick your butt in this specific area, right? Yeah. So that I'm literally positioning myself for the sale. And that's like, yeah. you just have to have that different mindset. So I'm really mm-hmm. glad you brought that up. That mm-hmm. was such a valid point that I didn't intend to talk about, but such a valid point to bring up. Mm-hmm. Cool, man. All right, so we got a couple more things we wanna to touch on. I think the next big thing that I wanted to talk to you about was in your situation, and this is why I think, and like it's kind of uh, unraveling in a way that you can see why it's so effective the way that it is doing this. I think it starts with, having the employer that embraces you, uh, embraces entrepreneurship, because then that negotiating conversation, negotiating like quote unquote, is a lot easier to have because you have an effective partner that a good environment, a good culture, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but here's the deal too, is if you didn't go that route, specifically if you're selling something to, you're selling like some kind of a C-suite solution or like corporate mm-hmm. you know, solution, right? Um, mm-hmm. something that is going to be to, to massive companies, right? Um, I think a lot of people, they, they don't necessarily know how to get their first opportunity with mm-hmm. selling to selling a B2B solution, like what you have, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. so they haven't done anything. And so, or at least that's what they, the story they tell themselves, right? That they haven't mm-hmm. done anything. Mm-hmm. And so they're, they, they're the companies they're pitching, they want to see them provide some kind of, you know, traction before they invest in this solution, right? Yep. So what is your recommendation of, hey, I'm this startup. And yes, I've been doing this for a long time with another company, but now I'm mm-hmm. branched off and doing it myself. How do you pitch other companies to uh, give you an opportunity mm-hmm. to utilize your solution? Hmm. Um, that, that's a good one. Uh, that, that's probably where I was talking about the first golden triangle, this okay. whole problem, customer problem, solution thing. Sure. Let's assume, uh, and again, my advice also when I when I work with startups is rather than pitch, go out with the objective to learn. Sure. Like as uh, I, I was mentioning before, when we when we uh, had the previous conversation, uh, often when you ask for money, you get advice. Versus sometimes when you ask for advice, mm. you may up ending uh, get money. Right. The worst. Um, so it's really the thing is have this learning mindset. Be okay. again human centered, customer centered. Yeah. Uh, figure out what is really the the the, the pains, the gains, but also the jobs that your customer has, the specific problem that informs the solution. And only yeah. then comes in the second triangle, which is and I've actually written a, an article about that. We we can maybe link that in the in the notes, sure. the second golden, what I call the second golden triangle, and the beauty is that that combines it to the diamond, which we call the Swiss <laughs> diamond. We're really branching <laughs> I this love thing. My analogies and like, <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's uh, the second one is then, and it's simple. And and I have not, we have not created this. We just curated that from existing okay. stuff uh, okay. because it has worked in the past and in my own experience. So then mm-hmm. comes in, you have nailed then when you have the customer problem. Uh, solution triangle basically okay. 
uh, and you have what we call the problem solution fit, you have achieved uh, the desirability bit of the second triangle because then it's desirability, feasibility, and viability. Okay. So again, like be sure to first have a market and that comes down to get your first customer, right? Mm -hmm. To get your first customer rather than pitch, go out and learn. And you will most likely end up co-creating a solution to the problem that you will better understand than anyone else because you don't come over as the guy who wants to sell you something pre-established, etc. You come as the guy who thinks he has and will show that he actually improved, that he has the means to solve a very specific challenge of this customer. And then you have the desirability bit. And at the same time, you then know and can, can double down on the feasibility bit where you go into actually developing it. Sure, sure, sure. Right? Your solution. And then comes the, the second or like the third element of the second triangle, which is the scalability, where of course you want to make sure while you build the solution to this specific problem, that it is also viable and that you can actually scale it in a profitable way. Okay. Right? Okay. And, and that sounds kind of high level uh, in a way, but that is really what it comes down to in terms of the structured approach that we take. And again, we use that within big companies, enterprise level for mm -hmm. entrepreneurial purposes okay. or for people, startups such as start out. It's basically a combination of uh, lean innovation. So design thinking, uh, lean startup and other agile methods, Yeah, right? Blended together. And, and it's then into creative collaborative problem solving. Yeah. So these blending together. Again, when you, when you just, starting out the key thing is really try and get out of the building as they say have empathy talk to as many people as you can but also try to figure out who are the right people you should talk to and yeah. who are the ones really having that problem the beauty is you may find out that they don't have the problem that you thought they don't need the solution right, that right. you have in mind right. but if you have this agnostic um, um, approach and you have the capability of stepping back and being in love with your problem or with the problem and not your solution, as Ash Maria says, um, then is where you uncover gold. Then is okay. when you learn and then is when you can pivot uh, to maybe a completely different problem for a completely different customer segment with a totally different solution. You, however, only came to that because you went on this learning and structured learning, validated learning and accelerated learning spree using these methods. And then again, this sounds uh, crazy, but it was really my experience. I went out for three months trying to learn more about what I had a hunch that was working. And we had two, three customers from different segments, but it was also very heterogenic. It was one was we needed to help with marketing. We know your blockchain experience and expertise. Can you help yeah. with that? Uh, we know your startup uh, tech, uh, you know, facility that you have you know so it was really for me personally also a struggle to figure out what to say no to mm. and what to really double down on yeah, and analyze, that was yeah. my way also to to use that in a very personal way to figure out uh how to you know maintain a level of of happiness and fulfillment yeah. because it's not that you're necessarily fulfilled by being successful yeah that's that's what a lot of people think but you can have had a huge career your whole life and be successful but never really feel fulfilled i mean yeah. that's just the thing and right. i really try to optimize for fulfillment in that yeah time. now when you say you went out ask yeah. questions mm -hmm. learn mm -hmm. have empathy from a practical standpoint where were you going how are you initiating <laughs> these conversations? Yeah. Right? Were you just running into them at coffee shops? So I, you know, I tell people because, and, and this is the reason I'm asking you this, Oliver, because yeah. I think a lot of people now, what we have, what we have done is, it's easy to send an email. It's easy to connect <laughs> with somebody on LinkedIn and send them a canned mm -hmm. response and just blast everybody and just drown mm -hmm. your voice out in line with everybody else's. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest things is missing. And actually, a friend of mine is he's been on the show, Morgan. Um, he's literally been traveling the world speaking, training, training SDRs. And yeah. he's yeah. like, dude, the biggest trick right now is just pick up the damn phone because nobody does that anymore. Like call him and ask <laughs> like, like, Hey, 
Like, can we chat about this specific thing? And then he's very inquisitive and he just shuts up and listens to what they have to say. So Mm. what are some practical steps that you would give people as far as Mm. where are you going to create this environment to have these conversations Mm -hmm. so that you can learn? Do you just Mm -hmm. stalk the guy that is the Coke CEO Mm -hmm. and figure out where he buys his Mm -hmm. Starbucks every morning and then say, hey, how can I like carry this conversation? You know what I mean? It's almost like finding like, hey, there's this girl that I like and I, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to ask her on a date, but I I don't know how to create the perfect environment to be able to like have conversations and build that relationship. You know what I mean? So what are, do you go to networking events? How do you know Mm -hmm. those networking events that those people attend? Is it a digital Mm -hmm. connection first and then a nudge to connect in person Mm -hmm. or how are you creating systematically mm-hmm. the environment for those things to happen yeah now, the key word is systematically and it's also again it's not either like it's not black or white it's a mix of different yeah, things that i've tried different. out that i've tested yeah. but um yes yeah, actually the most effective way for for our case has been linkedin okay. literally even inbound stuff combined with an, a social you know, selling inbound marketing strategy where again, it's right more, it's, it's not about me. Yes. It's not about what we do. It's about, hey, this is interesting. Yeah. This uh, is intriguing or this, we want to challenge that fact. What are your experiences? And oh, so yeah. on. And so that's how basically personally I managed to build um, this, you know, targeted, let's say, tribe or followership or community or whatever. Yeah. And that's, that's within this kind of community where then, the conversations happen but so it's it's a push and pull and it's often also i get and i'm so surprised people do that without a, a, a personalized invitation just the standard linkedin invitation hey right. would like to join the network i have a certain number of criteria whether or not i accept these invitations but what i always do is hey thanks for your invitation may i may i know what triggered you may i ask what triggered you and then uh depending on the the, the answer that comes back i most often then suggest, okay, let's have a conversation about this. Yeah. And that's how the learning then takes place. And that's the pull uh, in a way. And then the push is just more targeted in the sense, okay, uh, what is it that I want to specifically learn more about for our services, about our problems that we want to solve, about the specific solutions that we're already providing. And that never ceases. That's also with existing customers. We keep doing that, basically. Mm. Just trying to always be the one who understands best what they need, whether they know it or not yet, uh, we need to be the one to come up with the solutions for these challenges. Yeah, so and I feel like it, the more, the, yeah. the big, a big mistake that I, so for one, like I said, you almost set me on fire with this one because <laughs> this is why the world is trending towards value-driven content because mm-hmm. you can chase the cat, but why not plant yeah. some cheese and start drawing Absolutely. these suckers in? You know what I mean? You plant your, mm-hmm. your milk, right? Or whatever, whatever mm-hmm. metaphor you want mm-hmm. to use here, right? Mm-hmm. And start drawing people in because if you put stuff out there that's relevant to who your audience is, knowing who yeah. your audience is, someone that's looking specifically for your solution is going to stumble upon that and then they, they're going to come to you, right? Yeah. I, like I don't get... Everybody thinks that that's just like an online, you know, digital marketer type approach. I'm like, mm-hmm. the biggest missed opportunity right now in the tech space, mm-hmm. at least, and in mm-hmm. many offline, you know, typically mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. your traditional offline businesses, so to speak, is they don't get that. They think this yeah. is just something like, oh, these, you know, cutesy people post on Instagram. It's like, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. You put out value driven content because you mm-hmm. drive those people to your site because it's relevant yeah. to them. And then those are prospective customers. You nurture them and eventually they want to buy your solution. It literally is that simple. I don't yeah. know why any, everybody's not doing yeah. it. Like, yeah, and, and it's also there's, there's not just because it's digital that some ground rules do not apply anymore all of a yeah. sudden. Like when yeah. you're having a conversation, like initiate it in a proper fashion. Yeah. Like don't just go, uh, you know, just the, the, the standard thing, like zero research done, no motivation why exactly. you want to <laughs> connect with me. What, yeah. like, <laughs> even if it's just like, hey, I like yeah. your headshot, uh, you know, yeah, like, yeah, tell yeah, me yeah. who yeah. took it or whatever. Like, it yeah. doesn't matter, but just like yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of a basic, you know, uh, that maybe that's just me being, you yeah. know, uh, right. but yeah. anyhow. I think show that you've done some research in them, right? Mm-hmm. Show that you know who mm-hmm. they are, some yeah. of the challenges that they've had, because there's nothing worse when you can read through it where it's just some canned response that they just send to as many people as they possibly can. Exactly. Right? So when someone's actually taking the time to research those people that can address yeah. your specific potential wants, needs, and desires, or know at least mm-hmm. who you are in the world, right? Exactly. I think that, that goes a long way. And sometimes, honestly, um, you know, the, the biggest pitch that we get is to come on this show, 
right? Like you mm. saw my calendar, dude. There are not a lot open <laughs> for the next six to eight months. I mean, it's just not. <laughs> and and I tell people this. I'm like, you know, they they like they're like, oh, is there any openings on your show? I'm like, step in line. Like it's and, mm. and honestly, I can be booked for three years right now. That's not no bullshit. I can be booked for three years with the amount of pitches that we come, that we get mm. on a daily basis. But here's mm. the deal. I don't want to see your canned response. Tell me why you want to come on my show. There you go. What about go. me and my mm. show and what I mm. say and my guest and my mm. mission and my message mm -hmm. is relevant to what you have to say? Because mm -hmm. if you don't give me mm -hmm. that, you're not coming on this show. And we created an yeah. application and it literally is just that. If you go wow. in, and just copy and paste Excellent. your little pitch, you're not coming on my show. Great. So you have to Great. really do some research and know yeah. what the hell we talk about on here. And mm -hmm. know something mm -hmm. about me if you're going to mm -hmm. say, Hey, you know, your health message and it really mm -hmm. like inspired me. And like, I've been dealing with the same thing. Like, let's go, let's, let's chat. But if yeah. you give me some bullshit ass yeah. template, I'm not even gonna look twice. I'm barely even going to open it. Right. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's where it's about quality before quantity. Space. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think that's great. This putting this filter yeah. actually just enhances the impact. And again, for me, it's all about creating value and having as much impact as possible. And it's really about creating value first and foremost, rather than capturing value. Yeah. And the pitches that you can right away tell are like when it's all about uh, capturing value, like what's like, what do I want to push over to you? Not like what could we co-create together, yeah. right? How could we right. bake a bigger pie together? Right. right. And that's what it's about. It's not about, Hey, what can you give me? I think that is, and, and it oh, sounds, yeah. Yeah, 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 sounds yeah, cheesy, yeah. but really this abundance mindset yeah. or this like, hey, how about we, we give first, yeah. right? And, yeah. and again, it's the same thing with learning is like, hey, I, I care, right? Yeah. I have this empathy because I actually, it's not just a game. It's not just for, uh, you know, there is a bigger purpose behind it. And that's yeah. really how can I create more value? That's how can awesome. I help more people? And I think that's really what I want to scale. And that's what I want to help people mm -hmm. build. And, and that's, that was one of the reasons why we created Swiss Sleep. And I got challenged for that in terms of you know, how we define who we want to work with, these purpose-driven pioneers. Yeah. Uh, because it's not specific in terms of, okay, is it a B2B or a B2C approach, et cetera. But I literally had these conversations I was mentioning with one lady. I knew she was perfectly someone I want to work with and we will work together even she said stuff that i think verbatim we put on our website about what is you know the the key problem we're trying to solve and who is our key persona and it's just that right now she's in a big pharma company she however has already started this exploration process of doing so many different things uh sooner or later she will probably do her own thing or like whether on the side or full-time or whatever yeah. and basically her interest was also how can I transition? How can I maximize this? How can That's I figure awesome. out how to increase my impact and yeah. create even more value? I, yeah. I was blown away. I was like, well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That doesn't matter whether you're having a startup right now or you're being totally. in a even nonprofit in, a, in, a, in an NGO or whatever. It's about what is it that you want to create in terms of value? What's the impact you want to have? What is your purpose? And then how can we put rocket fuel onto that fire? Yeah. Cool, man. I love it. I love it. All right. So the last piece that I want to talk to you about before we let you go is the relationship stuff, right? I always try to like the, right. the, the people that I find that are uh, notable examples of how to navigate these various things. It's mm -hmm. tough, man. Like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I was an hour and a half away from my girlfriend that I ended up <laughs> my, my now wife. And if she hadn't moved, it would have been tough. I mean, and we, and that was like six months. So you're damn near on the other side of the world, if not the clear opposite <laughs> side of the world. So time zone issues, plus yeah. what the entrepreneurship journey requires. Your mind mm -hmm. is probably elsewhere. She's not an entrepreneur. So is that, mm -hmm. uh, how do you guys navigate that? Like where's common ground of things that you do share if you're really, that's the hard thing about entrepreneurs. It's like mm -hmm. most of us are so passionate and driven about what we're doing because if you are in alignment with what the impact that you want to make in the world is it's all you mm. need. like it's hard mm. to detach from that it's hard to disconnect so it's all you mm. want to talk about right mm -hmm. so how have you navigated the long distance thing are there certain things you put in place non-negotiables yeah. boundaries whatever mm -hmm. how do you guys find commonalities when you live completely different lives so mm -hmm. to speak and that you're an entrepreneur she's not kind of give mm -hmm. us some Dr. Phil relationship <laughs> advice here. 
Oh yeah, uh, I agree. It's tough, and it's uh, especially like building this entrepreneurial venture on, on the one hand side and building this, building and maintaining and continuing to build and develop the relationship on the other side is uh, is indeed challenging. And the distance and what comes with it is a key element. But I've, I mean, to be honest, I've had long distance relationships in the past as well and have had much more difficulty just managing them then. <laughs> yeah just it seems like my, my friends are like can't you like find the girl like you know next yeah. door what's wrong with them like why do you need to go to the other end of the world like, yeah. yeah that's another story but and i i believe i truly believe that i have done quite i've, I've come a long way also in terms of my personal development and, and my self-awareness and my self-control in a way uh, so you were talking about you know boundaries or things that we put in place, and that started with myself also. Again, transparency first, like in our communication, uh, we really tell it as it is, and we call each other out on behavior that could be like, "Hey, you're you're drifting off into again. Why were you? Are you with me? Are you present? Like, are you giving me your full attention or not? Mm. And if not, that's fine. But then let's you know maybe talk." about or talk later again but go yeah. on and do your stuff or mm -hmm. let's switch topic and do you want to talk about something that seems to be so uh, on your mind top of mind bothering you like can i support you in this and this is where my fiance is amazing she mm -hmm. is so supportive and actually i wouldn't even say she's not an entrepreneur she is a part-time teacher slash um, um, tutor because actually her passion is music and she's a singer in a band awesome. and, and actually several bands now and in order to accommodate the mm. lot of traveling that comes with that she's chosen to be this kind of flashing you know singing teacher teaching singer That's awesome. and uh, the advantage of that is that we get to see each other when she has a gig in Europe or she flies around the world somewhere else and I happen to be able to accommodate that as well so we try to turn that into an advantage and so she's also used to, in this way, kind of an entrepreneurial way of, of managing her life. She's used to that freedom with the pros, but also the cons that it brings with. So also the, the need for self-discipline. And that's another big one for, for the two of us. Like we really try to motivate each other regularly and hold each other accountable, right? So transparency, communication, mutual support, and how we do that is also like, again, it comes back to empathy and really deeply caring about the other first, I would argue more than about yourself and not forgetting that both of you are individuals yeah. and it's not just the couple and the couple above everything. It's really like you need to be fulfilled and happy and, uh, and on fire as an individual first to be able to then nurture that into the relationship. Because otherwise, if you just focus only on the relationship, you may as weird as it sounds, burn out as an individual. Mm. And I think that balance, we continuously keep striking it. And it's not always easy. And especially with, you know, the distance. Yeah. But you mentioned time difference. Actually, the nine hour time difference is not that bad because when it's morning for me in Switzerland, it's evening for her in San Diego and vice versa. So basically on an average, we I would say hear each other at least once per day, if not twice, morning and evening respectively. So that's not too bad. Right. And then um, I also think that vulnerability is a key thing. Mm. I'm being super vulnerable. I've actually had this conversation with my dad and he was like, I don't think you should be so transparent, literally like so vulnerable in general, but especially now that you're building your business and, you know, with struggles that it brings with, etc. And I think you should not put that on uh, your girlfriend or your fiance. And I was like, um, that's a really interesting point of view. And, and, I mean, I take that, but I think that has been one of the key things for both of us to be openly, transparently vulnerable with each other, because only then can you really effectively support each other, because mm -hmm. then you know what's really going on with the other, yeah. right? And so it takes both. It takes willingness to support, but it takes also willingness to be open and vulnerable to get that support that you really need. Yeah. I guess that was pretty much Dr. Phil, wasn't it? <laughs> no, no, spot on, man. It's, uh, spot on. Yeah. And I think you just, like you said, you just make it work. And I think also, too, one thing I'll note is that you you put a lot of positive reframes in what most mm -hmm. people would deem challenges. I think a lot of people would dwell on the challenges. Mm -hmm. And you're like, hey, we got to talk twice a day. 
it yeah. actually lines up perfectly because it's morning and evening. Most people would be like, oh, well, I got to wake up and I got to talk to her in the morning. I'm in the middle of my work and what I'm trying to do or I'm trying to go to bed and she's just waking up. You know what I mean, they would see the negatives in it. And I like that you reframe yeah. the positives, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, here's the deal. This is where I would look at it. Mm -hmm. How blessed are you to be yeah. in the world in 2019 to be able to have a relationship with somebody exactly. on the other side of the world? Exactly. That's, that's truly amazing. Yeah. Right, like that, like, and, oh, like, can you imagine like trying to do that yeah. without the, the technological abilities that we have today? Exactly. Like, impossible. Exactly. So I was just about to say today with the tools that we have, I mean, I mentioned previous business relationships. I'm used to the, the calling cards where you have to scratch off and then use a pay phone and to like, yeah. you know, and then it locked for 20 minutes and you blow 20 bucks on that. And Oof. now you have basically a video on your smartphone yeah. and you can be like cooking with each other yeah. like on the opposite ends of the world so yes awesome. i agree and so it's gratitude for that but in general and then also the technological possibilities yeah. uh, are are really helping us all right man so the the, the elephant in the room is <laughs> who's moving because you're not oh. gonna have a, a long distance oh. marriage who's yeah. moving where <laughs> That's that's a great one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that, I would I would actually be also for testing that because I'm all for having different, um, let's say, uh, headquarters. Okay. Right. So my idea was kind of why not have the best of both worlds, Europe and the states? Because California yep. is pretty nice, right? I love Europe. I love Switzerland for the stability, for the four seasons, for a lot of things, the comforts that we have and all that. But I also love Asia. I've lived and worked in Southeast Asia for a while. So that's one thing I'm like, keep kind of pitching in a way. Why not try out that for a couple of months, right? And so what's going to happen, in, uh, going to happen short term is basically uh, we will uh, focus on Switzerland for like a year or two before then uh, potentially more going back to the state because she's very much like hey i'm a cali girl you know mm -hmm. she's lived around the world as well she's also half japanese she has this multicultural background as well and this awareness and affinity but she's mm -hmm. very in, in rooted in, in san diego and california so long term most likely going to be oriented towards uh, california towards the us short term and that has also to do with me being in the position that I'm right now, just having started out building that business. So I want to yeah. be independent, lo location independent yeah. as much as I can, but it's also strategically just for me easier in a way to be based in Switzerland, to have like a, a really condensed kind of market, so to speak, versus the US where in a way I'm a nobody. And, you know, again, nobody i'm telling myself that maybe that's not true sure, that's what i'm right. trying to figure out right? right but so it's it's a consensus again short term switzerland medium long term it's probably going to be the us or uh like a double or triple kind of solution where we have the possibility to move around Sounds that would be my Sounds my like dream in a way a lot of conversations to have over the next few yeah years. yeah that's yeah. awesome man Cool, yeah. dude. It was great to catch up with you, man. I appreciate it. That was a, a tremendous value. I mean, just really building on the last conversation that we had. We'll have to circle back around, hopefully, in another however long for you to come back on the show and give <laughs> us an update about where you guys are living and what's going on and how things are going with your business. Uh, so I appreciate it, man. Thanks for dropping by, and I'll catch up Thank with you. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. All right. See you. Talk soon. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.